the Dean of the University of Wisconsin Law School. It's a pleasure to have all of you participating in this conference and particularly in this panel. When Jason Yaki of our faculty sent around something um, inviting people from our faculty here at UW Law to serve as moderators, um, he asked us to choose which panel we might want to moderate. And, and I put this one down as my first choice. My main area of research is election law. Um, and uh, although I do some comparative work, uh, my research is focused mainly on US election law, not just over the past year, but over the past decade or so, I, I've been increasingly concerned about the stability of democracy in the United States and increasingly believe that while there are some things in my own field of election law that can be done to stabilize and strengthen American democracy, the problems with our democracy go well beyond the way in which we conduct elections. And so it's a privilege to have three distinguished scholars with us today. Uh, Josh Braver from our faculty at UW Law, David Landau from Florida State's College of Law and Marcella Prieto from USC Law School to talk about the law and politics of democratic erosion and rebirth. I'm gonna just give very brief introductions to each of the panelists in, in um, I'll do it immediately before they speak. So those introductions are fresh in our minds. Um, and I'm gonna present them in the order that they appear in the program with Josh going first. Uh, Josh, as I just mentioned, is a member of our faculty here at the University of Wisconsin Law School. He is an assistant professor. His research lies primarily at the intersection of con law and political theory, including uh, research on past constitutional conflicts and how we might use them to construct limiting principles for moments at which the law's boundaries are pushed, stretched, or violated. Um, he earned his BA degree from UC Berkeley and his PhD in political science, as well as his JD from the Yale Law School. Uh, Josh is going to be presenting a paper on impeachment today, talking about uh, impeachment in the United States, but also in Brazil. And so with that, Josh, I'll turn it over to you to kick us off in fine fashion today. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for the introduction. Um, thank you so much to my, my co-panelists uh, for um, being on this panel with me. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure and honor. I've, I've learned so much from your, from your work. Um, the model for impeachment is for being a bad actor. You don't vote someone out because you don't like your, their policies, um, because you think that they're um, incompetent. You vote someone out because they violated narrow and specific prohibitions, prohibitions that should bind any president regardless of their party. Recently, scholars have argued against this narrow focus. Uh, David Landau is, is one of those scholars and that's why I'm very happy to have him here today. And I don't know if I would, uh, and some blame a combination of overly narrow, narrowly constitutional provisions and also the lawyers who set the terms of public debate around them, right? The problem is these constitutional provisions are limiting the grounds for impeachment to this bad actor model. This article argues, or hopefully an article one day, will argue that politics, not law, not the constitutional provisions, are driving the predominantly narrow understanding of the legitimate grounds for impeachment. I do this through analyzing what I hope will be the four successful cases of impeachment in countries that have a broad constitutional impeachment clause. These are countries where you can impeach someone for almost any reason, for what some have called general dissatisfaction clauses. And I'm curious, to what extent do they use these broad clauses or do they use narrower grounds? Okay, first, the, the, the problem of legalization that uh, I'm addressing or arguing uh, against. 
So in presidential systems, a constitution normally enumerates and limits the grounds for impeachment. So in the United States, for example, we have in our constitution, you can impeach someone for treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors. This in turn empowers constitutional lawyers to set the boundaries on impeachment discourse, right? They're the experts on the constitution. They're gonna try and tell us what are and are not um, the right ways to interpret these, these, uh, these grounds for impeachment. And they try to use um, such boundaries to constrain the actions of politicians. And in one sense, they're successful. Right? I do think um, law professors often succeed in setting the terms of the debate, right? the discourse. So in the United States, if you turn on Fox News or Rachel Maddow, right, they may not be agreeing with the conclusions that these professors reach, but they're using the same terms of the debate. Politicians, though, nonetheless proceed to vote in a way that will maximize their chances of being reelected. So the critique is, if politicians are inevitably going to act like politicians, we should stop playing the silly game of trying to limit the grounds for impeachment. Let's fess up to what we all know. Politicians will vote for impeachment based on their narrow political interests and based on dissatisfaction with the way a president is governing, right? With their policies, with the, their administration. In fact, Tom Ginsburg, Aziz Huck, and David Lando look at some detail and they show that impeachment is a good thing. They marshal statistical evidence to show that it does not have a bad effect on the quality of democracy. And so they call for moving from a traditional bad actor model of an impeachment. And they praise the few constitutions that legally empower politicians to impeach a president for what they call general dissatisfaction, right? They can, they're generally dissatisfied with the president's performance and his policies. And they say that it allows a reset of the political system. Broad and political impeachment are a positive good that pose little threat to democracy, according to Landau and his co-authors. Constitutions thus should be drafted to allow impeachment for disagreement over policy. I am a little skeptical about whether this would work out in practice. And to illustrate, I discuss all four cases of successful impeachment since 1990 in countries that have a general dissatisfaction clause in their constitution. Right? So these are countries that have a general dissatisfaction clause and they've had a successful impeachment uh, since 1990. And there have only been four countries, Venezuela in 1993, South Africa in 2016, Brazil in 1992, Brazil in 2016, and maybe Brazil like tomorrow or in the next couple of months, uh, we'll, we'll see. And what I think I'll find, um, and this I, I'll show is the case in Brazil in 2016, is that in each example, politicians chose narrower grounds than general dissatisfaction to impeach the president. And I'm curious about the political logic behind this. So this paper's at an early stage. I've only begun taking a look at Brazil, which is what I'll talk about here. And in Brazil, we do find this mismatch between the broad options available, most charges chosen. So in 2015, the Brazilian political system is mired in a deep legitimacy crisis. The economy had entered into a deep depression, spontaneous protests seized the streets, and corruption scandals had enmeshed all of the dominant and rival political parties. As the most prominent and powerful politician in the country, President Dilma Rousseff quickly became the target of the country's rage. And this rage was channeled through impeachment. But the channeling was peculiar. The Brazilian constitution almost has a general dissatisfaction clause. The grounds for impeachment are very, very broad. You can impeach someone for acts of the president that are attempts against the federal constitution. And then those attempts are enumerated very broadly. So if you do anything that's against the existence of the union, the free exercise of the powers of different branches of government, the exercise of political, individual, and social rights, internal security of the country. Here's probably the broadest one, probity and administration, right? In the United States, they reject this in the constitutional convention as maladministration, right? Specifically something we think in the United States you cannot impeach on this basement for. The budget law, um, and compliance with laws and court decisions. So I think it's important to keep in mind just a few of these um, probity and administration, just how broad that is, the existence of the union and the budget law. So the actual impeachment of Dilma 
did not focus on probity and administration, did not focus on the existence of the union. Instead, the charges were on violating the budget law, right? Which is not what these spontaneous protests are about. So I won't go into too much detail, but just to get you, give you kind of an idea of, um, to be frank, how pitiful I think some of these, these charges were. The first charge was fiscal peddling. This is which state banks effectively gave the Brazilian government a temporary loan in order for it to pay for approved social welfare programs. The second charge was fiscal responsibility crimes, a charge centered on the issues of six decrees for supplementary credits without congressional approval. Um, and I can explain that more in, in questions and answers. And I don't, maybe pitiful is too strong. I don't wanna completely trivialize these charges. I think they are infractions of the law. I think they are infractions that by no means are unprecedented, but that went beyond the practice of previous governments. Nonetheless, I think there is substantial reason to doubt that they are actually impeachable offenses. And more importantly, they have little or nothing to do with the public's complaints about the poor state of the country. So what was really going on? Why this mismatch between the possibilities of why you can impeach and the actual grounds? And one thought, and I, I'd have to go through more detail, but one thought is that it has to do with protecting um, members of Dilma's coalition. So the Brazilian political system is extremely fractured with a large number of political parties. And to wield power effectively in Brazil, presidents form coalitions with parties that are rivals and have incompatible ideologies. Rousseff's government was no exception. Why Rousseff's party always stuck by her in impeachment, rival political parties within the very large and heterogeneous coalition government participated in and sometimes led the drive for impeachment. But that means they're impeaching someone within their own coalition. Aren't they in some sense complicit in the policies of that government? How can they avoid blame for the very reasons for which she is really being impeached? Right. And so they narrow down these originally 34 very broad charges to focus on two charges that have to deal not with the policies in which they were a part of, but Rousseff's individual acts, right? The stuff about fiscal peddling, about violating the budget law. And by so doing, the parties could redirect away focus and escape responsibility for the larger policies and corruption crises in which they were implicated. So to, to wrap up about implications, this investigation reveals a deep irony in the scholarship of Tom Ginsburg and his co-authors. Marshalling substantial empirical evidence, a real contribution, they argue that impeachments do not affect the health of democracy, so they should be normalized and accepted. But I'm curious if they succeed in politicizing impeachment, they may raise the costs, right? They think that politicizing impeachment by allowing it for general dissatisfaction grounds will allow more of it. And I'm wondering if it might actually have the opposite effect. They may raise the cost and make impeachment an even rarer phenomenon. So where does this lead constitutional designers? Just to be clear, the reason why it raises the cost is right now you can impeach, right? And you can say, uh, I'm impeaching because this person is a bad actor and try and deflect blame from yourself. But if you as a politician have to actually say, I'm impeaching for the policies that I supported and voted for, that means impeachment is gonna be a higher cost for you and you're less likely to do it. So, so what should we do instead? I mean, especially if we accept, I think that impeachment is an important good and an important check and perhaps should be expanded. Here are two possibilities. First, if the goal is to force politicians to forthrightly state the true motivations, the constitution should allow only one broad and political ground for impeachment, such as general dissatisfaction. Given multiple choices, politicians tend to choose the narrower and more legalistic grounds. By cutting off these legal grounds, the constitution may effectively force politicians to be honest that they seek to depose the president because they disagree with their policies or ideology. Second, and alternatively, constitutional designers can accept that legalization is a way to smooth over the difficulties of impeaching a president on pure political grounds. We could acknowledge that hypocrisy is not only inevitable in politics, but it can be a good and civilizing force, right? It may hurt us as scholars and theorists who want rational consistency, but hypocrisy may actually be kind of greasing the wheels and lowering the costs of impeachment.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Our next speaker is David Landau. He is Mason Ladd Professor and Associate Dean for International Programs at Florida State University's College of Law. He's a scholar, a distinguished scholar on constitutional theory, constitutional design, and comparative constitutional law. His work has focused on a range of issues, uh, which includes constitutional change, constitution making, the judicial role in the enforcement of rights, impeachment, and the erosion of democracy. And today he'll be presenting a co-authored paper with Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Huck on the law of democratic disqualification. David. Well, thank you so much, um, Dan and, uh, and Josh. Uh, I appreciate that presentation. I look forward to the exchange. I think it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting project. Um, you know, and I, I want to engage it a, a bit if we have time in the, in the q and I think, um, so this piece uh, is like a kind of a sequel to the impeachment piece in a way. Um, you know, we wrote the impeachment piece and we remain very interested, obviously, in these questions, both empirically and theoretically. Um, and following, you know, January 6 events uh, and the responsibility of uh, President, former President Trump for those events, we wanted to write a piece on disqualification as kind of a uh, sequel to impeachment. Um, obviously the difference, you know, the impeachment piece focuses on removal from office. The disqualification piece focuses on essentially being disqualified from seeking future office, right? And so we try to do a few things in the paper. Um, the first is to kind of map descriptively the landscape of these provisions around the world to bring together a bunch of stuff, much of which has been heavily covered by scholars, but to try to kind of bring it together in one paper and look at what the, what the matrix of disqualification mechanisms looks like. Uh, and then the second is to kind of think a little bit normatively about what uh, optimal disqualification regimes might look like both comparatively and within the US, right? Um, and so that first piece, you know, what we develop in the paper is kind of a matrix of, um, of, of disqualification rules. Um, like any typology, I think it, it, it kind of breaks down a little bit if you press on it too much, right? It's a rough approximation, but the idea would be, you know, you could think of two axes essentially, um, retrospective versus proscriptive, prospective, focus, in other words, backward versus forward looking as the focus of the rule, and then individual versus group, right? Uh, so are you focusing on individuals or are you focusing on, on, on a broader group? Um, and I think like, so, so then you can kind of fill out each, each box. Um, uh, so on the, at the group level, retrospective, you have things like illustration rules, right? That attempt to disqualify groups of actors for affiliation with the prior regime. You often see this in, in transitions um, to, to democracy, for example. Um, pro, prospective uh, group, you see things like uh, party bans, which often focus on the danger that a given party or militant democracy type provisions, which focuses on the danger that a given party or movement poses to a democratic order. Uh, then on the individual side, retrospectively, you have things that are kind of uh, linked to uh, impeachment mechanisms um, where you can disqualify in conjunction with impeachment. Both the US and Brazil, for example, have uh, disqualification rules that are closely linked to impeachment procedures. Um, and then you can have potentially non-political pathways to reaching the same results, right? So you can have uh, administrative or judicial type of determinations that disqualify uh, individuals, sometimes on quite broad standards. Um, in the Israeli case, sort of, you know, uh, lacking good character, right? And things along those lines that have been used to disqualify officials from seeking or remaining in office. Um, finally, kind of a prospective individual tool, uh, you have uh, term limits, right? Which seek to disqualify individuals from office um, based on future damage that you might do to democracy based on being in power for having already been in power for a long period of time. And so we kind of take that typology 
look at all of those uh, examples, try to kind of draw them out uh, within the piece. Um, and I think what we find is they're all problematic, right? Of course, comparatively, but they do all seem to go to a pretty widely felt need um, for some kind of disqualification rule in the system, right? So you've got, it starts to flesh out a normative tension where, which is familiar, I think, where you need these mechanisms as defenses of democracy. It's widely thought within modern democratic orders that you have to have these boundary conditions. Um, but at the same time, obviously all of these things pose their own dangers to democracy, right? And it's not hard to find examples of where they've been used for essentially anti-democratic rather than pro-democratic ends. It's the clearest, I think, with both lustration and, um, and uh, militant democracy, where I think the problems are familiar, right? Uh, there's a, there's a, a risk with respect to both of those that they become kind of too broad, that you start to disqualify actors um, who like weren't closely affiliated with the regime. You might do that in order to eliminate political rivals, you might do that out of a genuine sense that there's a taint, but in a way that nonetheless affects the democratic order and also the kind of the practical capacity of the state, right? I mean, you think about events like the de debathification stuff in Iraq um, as a good example, maybe of the, of the latter condition. And Eastern Europe is, is or, or the post-Soviet world is kind of rife with examples of illustration causing uh, Causing these these kinds of these kinds of problems in some cases. A related problem is what you might call kind of normalization. Something that starts out as kind of transitional then becomes a permanent feature, right, of the political order, um, and doesn't disappear, right? And it's kind of expected as a piece of the politics. Um, and so there's a there's a question of like when to turn these mechanisms, which are I think fundamentally transitional, kind of off, right? Uh, and I think something somewhat similar happens with militant democracy, although we don't envision it in quite the same terms, um, partly because it is a little bit more perspective than uh, illustration. But you, you have similar risks, right, of, um, you know, the, the literature and, and case laws rife with examples of militant democracy being used as a way to eliminate um, political opponents, right? There's a risk of kind of, uh, overuse or lack of proportionality in use. I think of the, the South Korean case, which banned a small party that had, you know, for alleged kind of ideological links with North Korea is an interesting example of that potential uh, logic. Uh, and then you have the same question of kind of, are these mechanisms transitional or kind of normalized? And I think if you look at Germany, which is kind of the modern paradigm of these sorts of provisions, right? You do see maybe that kind of a life cycle where the idea is as the, as the system normalizes, um, the, the need for these kind of provisions um, may go down. I mean, you, you, you see that kind of the most recent, the most recent German case, at least that seems to be one of the assertions the court is implicitly, is implicitly making. Uh, the third and fourth categories, the individual categories, uh, I think are also very interesting. They raise dangers that are related, although, I, I think somewhat somewhat different, right? Um, so the impeachment mechanism, one of the things we said in our earlier impeachment paper uh, that Josh I think picked up on is impeachment's quite rare, right? So it doesn't it doesn't happen frequently uh, in any, you know, in, in most presidential democracies, it's kind of a, a rare event. And disqualification, if anything, seems to be harder when it's connected to impeachment. So, you know, you look at the, the course of the US. Uh, the successful impeachments generally involved uh, federal judges. And interestingly, like many of those actors weren't disqualified, right, from office. They were just removed. Uh, the Brazilian impeachment with Rousseff is also very interesting in that she was impeached, uh, but not disqualified from seeking future office, right? She was removed from office, but not disqualified. So there's a question as to how well this legislative route, I think for some of the political considerations that Josh is laying out, how well that works effectively as a way to disqualify. The alternatives, which some countries do have, are far more robust. When you take it outside of the legislative sphere and make it an administrative or judicial tool, there is a possibility of having a much more robust mechanism. Uh, places like Colombia, Pakistan, Israel all show this, right? Where there is a pretty active set of judicial or administrative actors. 
involved in disqualifying uh, both elected and non-elected officials. Those raise their own risks, uh, but obviously lack of, lack of kind of activity is, is, is not one of them. So it does seem like if you take this out of the legislative sphere, you get, you get a more active uh, disqualification mechanism. Term limits finally, it seems to us, right, particularly when you're talking about the chief executive, work pretty work reasonably well as constraints, right? They have some advantages over the other over the other mechanisms. They're uh, kind of um, rule-like in comparison to being sort of uh, standard-like. Um, the vast majority of presidential democracies, as we know, have some kind of uh, uh, term limit in place. Um, sometimes it's a permanent bar after a few terms. Sometimes it's a temporary bar right after serving one or more terms. Um, but of course, one of the risks you face with term limits as a disqualification tool is the frequency of evasion, right? And there's a fairly recent literature that shows evasion attempts are not uncommon and they pretty frequently succeed. Um, so what we want to, we kind of map out this comparative matrix of, of what disqualification regimes look like and then try to draw some conclusions as to what this would be normatively. I think that piece is quite hard, right? Um, but we want to do two things, kind of map out comparative implications and then map out more specifically implications uh, for the US. Uh, and um, comparatively, you know, we think some things do kind of come through from this map that we're, that we're kind of uh, working out, right? Um, one is that it seems like, um, you, you face this tension between needing these kind of rules, right? But worrying about their overuse in a wide range of countries. Um, one way to tackle that effectively, we think is to have multiple pathways for disqualification um, and to actually have, if anything, at least some of those routes be non-political routes in the sense of they don't run through a legislative body, right? But they run through judicial or administrative actors that that responds better, we think, to the range of modern threats uh, to, to the democratic order. Um, relatedly, we think there should be a preference, particularly in less transitional contexts, for individual instead of group disqualification mechanisms. Um, we think there ought to be a mix of rules and standards, uh, but perhaps that the system ought to lean in some ways towards rules, right, which are easier to enforce. So an advantage of a term limit is it's rule-like nature, um, which reduces susceptibility to things like abuse. And finally, we tend to think that temporary disqualification rules uh, are often both more effective and make more sense than permanent disqualification, right, as a tool. Um, so you would want to potentially disqualify for a period of time rather than disqualifying forever. And you see variants of this around the world with, with all of the different types of disqualification mechanisms that we look at. Um, finally, I guess, let me spend just a, a few minutes, I think, talking about the U.S., right, and the implications uh, for the U.S., which are quite difficult, I think. Uh, I mean, one of the things that jumps out that's quite interesting is that the U.S. actually has a lot of these disqualification mechanisms in place, right, which is interesting. Uh, so it has, um, you know, it obviously has disqualification alongside impeachment, which got a lot of attention. Uh, during the second Trump impeachment. Uh, it has a lustration-like mechanism, right, which is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which allows for uh, potential disqualification of a kind of class, right, based on uh, the insurrection and rebellion standard that shows up in that, in that article and was obviously linked very closely to, to, the, to the Civil War. Um, and then uh, it also, of course, has a, has a term limit, kind of prototypical in fact, most common term when we found it around the world, which is the you know, 22nd Amendment, two terms and you're out um, uh, forever. Uh, you don't see, obviously, militant democracy party banning uh, provisions in, in the US, at least in that kind of direct sense. So we ask, you know, to some degree, like, what, what could you do in the US? And I think the suggestions range from the maybe more realistic, albeit not particularly realistic in this political context to fanciful, right? But kind of interesting uh, to think through. Um, and so we start with stuff that wouldn't involve, um, wouldn't involve formal constitutional amendment. Um, and we think that, for example, 
Section three of the 14th Amendment, if revitalized and kind of thought about in the first way, in the right way, could do chunks of what uh, we suggest would be closer to a kind of optimum disqualification regime, right? Even though it's a very old provision, even though it was linked to a particular transitional context, and even though, as we point out, illustration provisions are dangerous, right? Uh, they can be quite problematic. But we think that, you know, what would be useful potentially would be a congressional kind of framework statute, this power, we think, you know, that seems to be pretty clearly explicitly given within the 14th Amendment, uh, that would give Congress the ability to flesh out, elaborate on the insurrection and rebellion standard in a way that would uh, do a better job of responding to modern democratic threats. So flesh out the standard uh, to clearly indicate, for example, that things like uh, election subversion are covered, right? Uh, because I think one of the problems with the standard as written is that it may not cover a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, modern threats to democracy. Um, relatedly, a statute could do a lot with the standard, with the, with the kind of uh, the process, um, and there's some analogs here um, after, you know, I, I think for events after the Civil War where the provisions were applied, albeit relatively briefly, right, and relatively lightly in most cases, but uh, it's, it seems to be pretty clearly within um, congressional power to figure out the sort of process by which disqualification would succeed. Uh, the analog is to a relatively um, kind of judicialized process rather than a relatively political one that would be led by Congress. And we think that that kind of judicialized process could have some advantages, some problems too, obviously, right? So one thing that I think the paper helps think through is ways in which the 14th, uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment could be used to create a relatively coherent uh, retrospective, but individual rather than group-like uh, set of norms that could be used to help defend democracy. Uh, the second point is related to the 22nd Amendment uh, or the, the, you know, the, the term limit essentially, right? Which is to say that I think that comparative experience suggests that there's complacency in the US about the possibility of uh, evasion um, or tension with respect to the term limit. We haven't seen it directly yet. Although, I mean, if you followed uh, discourse in the last administration closely, you would see statements that would be alarming, I think, right? Vis-a-vis -vis the term limit. Uh, and it's not clear, you know, like who would enforce the term limit at the end of the day, whether it's a, there's a pretty reasonable risk that would be deemed a political question, for example. Um, and so we think here too, that there's room for things like a, a framework statute that would kind of clarify mechanisms of enforcement uh, and may be helpful. Um, now, those are modest, relatively modest suggestions. Even so, they feel unrealistic to be frank, right? Different, they're uphill, they're uphill climbs, I think. Um, one thing I think we would we agree that we wouldn't want to see, there's a recent paper by Miguel Shore calling for militant democracy mechanisms in the US. It's a really interesting paper. But we think that, you know, if you if you think through the risks and also the tension with the First Amendment in the US context, uh, it's you know, the party banning mechanisms in a democratic order like the US is uh, probably bears more risks, right, than, than reward. So I think like that's the piece of the matrix we probably wouldn't favor bringing in. If you got more ambitious and thought about constitutional amendment, um, you could, I think, imagine a kind of reimagining of the, of the system. And there, I mean, just to sketch it very briefly, what we would, what we think may be a good idea is a kind of decoupling of disqualification from, from impeachment, right? So that the, the sole route to disqualification doesn't run through um, the, the basically very difficult, right, uh, political impeachment process, which in the US context, given the need for substantial supermajorities uh, and the political context is quite difficult um, to, to wield. Uh, and so the alternative, um, you know, we, we would suggest would be something that, as you see in a number of other countries around the world, sort of decouples the two and uses uh, judicial administrative processes as a potential supplement for disqualification. That raises substantial risks, right? I mean, all of these systems that we look at have problems uh, with, with respect to those mechanisms. But um, 
it would also allow, I think, a more active process for disqualification in the in the defense of democracy. Right. So that's essentially where we come down come down normatively, although normatively far more tentatively, I think, right, than our, our descriptive uh, map. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think if nothing else, I hope we have succeed in highlighting disqualification and showing that all of these fragmented things, all of which have been studied, right, are actually part of that matrix. And it's, and it's suggesting that this is one of the central uh, problems uh, that uh, modern democracies face right given the nature given the nature of the of the threats and the frequency of democratic erosion in recent years I'll stop there thank you so much david our final panelist is marcella prieto she's an assistant professor of law at usc's gold school of law where her research focuses on international law the international laws of armed conflict and political moral and legal philosophy uh, she uh, earned her LLM and JSD degrees from NYU and going further back between 2012 and 2014 worked in the Chilean Ministry of the Interior Human Rights Program prosecuting crimes against humanity during the Pinochet regime. Her paper focuses on the importance of political narratives and the self-enforcement of interim constitutions, particularly in Chile. Marcela. Thank you so much, Dan, for that um, introduction. And thanks um, also to Josh for putting the panel together. And I'm very happy to be here. So um, this is a paper, as Dan was saying, about the importance of political narratives on the capacity of interim constitutions to remain self-enforcing. And this is a paper that my co-author, Sergio Verdugo, and I have been working for a while. And he's actually here, I think, in the audience. And um, it's a paper that started with us um, looking at the Chilean process and looking at the negative models that we could find. And eventually, we moved to look at the political narratives in that process, in those narratives, and um, how they are playing out in the process of support and withdrawing support for the agreement. So um, our paper then aims to contribute to the literature, right, that focuses particularly on interim constitutions and how interim constitutions can be self-enforcing. And we argue in this article that political narratives are one of the many relevant factors in um, the likelihood or the capacity of an interim constitution to be self-enforcing. And in particular, we say that <clears throat> we can distinguish between core interests and political narratives. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that later. And in doing so, right, um, moderate political narratives are likely to maintain the capacity of self-enforcement of, of the interim constitution whereas radical political narratives, radicalized political narratives are less likely to have that effect. And we look at all of these things in the context of the Chilean constitution making process and using it as an illustration of how these things work out. So one of the first things that we need to do in the article in order to support the argument that political narratives are an element, right, or a relevant factor in assessing the capacity of an interim constitution to remain self-enforcing, is that we have to distinguish between the core interests of political rivals and the political narratives that can be used to justify those core interests. And the core interests of the rivals, right, can vary obviously depending on the different context and they might include substantive principles or they can include procedural rules that aim to promote um, inclusive or consensus-based approaches to constitution making. They may include supermajority rules and so on. And the main idea then is that in the interim constitution, rival parties accept to respect each other's core interests in exchange for the rivals, obviously, to do the same, right? And the political narratives are then different from core interests because um, core interests tend to be more concrete or specific and can be written in the form 
of a particular rule. By contrast, we see political narratives as the discourses that politicians generally use in trying to justify their support for the interim constitution, usually amongst themselves or also in conversation with the public at large. So these political narratives right, are more abstract in comparison to core interests. And they <clears throat> make reference to general ideas such as the need for political transformation, a need for decolonization, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And these narratives are usually not included, right, as part of the interim constitution. They are not put forward in the shape of a rule, but they are used by political parties to communicate, right, their political agendas and why they support or not the um, interim constitution. So in, if we want to sort of um, look at the relationship between the narratives and the core interests, we're going to see that usually the narratives are going to justify and support the party's core interests at an abstract level. And they are also sometimes able to justify the rival's core interests at that level. And if they do, if they are able to support the rival's core interests, the interim constitution is likely, more likely than to become self-enforcing. But if these political narratives, right, are not able to support or at least justify or at least be compatible with the core interests of the rival, then the um, self-enforcement capacity of the, interim, of the interim constitution is going to decrease. So <clears throat> we argue, of course, then that the stability of the interim constitution, the capacity to remain self-enforcement will be threatened, right, when the core interests of political adversaries relate to political narratives that are or with time become incapable of supporting the adversary's core interests. And this might happen because even though the core interests, which as I said at the beginning, are more concrete and can take the form of a rule, may remain stable over time, political narratives can um, change quite a lot during time and they may radicalize over time. And in doing so, they may become incompatible with uh, more moderate versions of those narratives that could justify the core interests. So <clears throat> we also distinguish between political narratives uh, among radical and moderate versions of the same narrative. So moderate versions can give usually sufficient justification for the core interests of the rival, whereas radical versions usually will not be able to do so, which means obviously that if radical versions prevail in the public discourse or among political parties or political actors, we can expect that the interim constitution is less likely to remain self-enforcing. So to look at this in the <clears throat> context of Chile, right, we first need to uh, find an interim constitution, obviously, that is the one that is to remain self-enforcing. It also requires us to identify the core interests of the political parties, as well as the political narratives that justify those interests and the moderate and radical versions of those narratives. So in the context of Chile, right, the constitution making process started in um, 2019 with a multi-party agreement signed by various political parties after massive demonstrations on the streets. And this agreement was later operationalized and included in the current constitution through a constitutional amendment. And um, the agreement basically included a couple of rules and entry plebiscite, the establishment of a constitution making body and um, a super majority rule for the approval of constitutional norms. And we argue that this um, agreement can be understood as an interim constitution, at least under Goss's definition, because it takes place at a critical juncture in the country, right? We have a crisis of legitimacy. We have protests on the streets. Um, we have negotiation among rival parties and the legal validity of the agreement is obviously aimed to be temporary. The new constitution can or will eventually replace them. And we can also see um, in it pre-commitments that aim to influence the content of the future constitution. So we can see then in the agreement, the key compromise between the right and the left wing parties. And if we want to simplify those core interests in order for the argument to work, we can see that the right wing um, supported as one of its core interests, the supermajority requirement for the approval of constitutional norms by two thirds, and also the establishment of certain limits on the 
convention that was going to eventually draft the new constitution. And if we look at the left wing parties, we're going to see that their core interests are basically the idea of the blank slate, the idea that the default rule in the case of lack of agreement about a constitutional norm was not going to be the current constitution. And also as a core interest, just having a popularly elected body drafting the new constitution. Obviously there are more, um, it's possible to identify other core interests. We focus on this paper on those that are largely procedural, right? And if we look at the narratives that are um, right now taking place in the Chilean debate, we can see we identify um, on the part of uh, right wing and center right parties, what we call evolutive narratives. These are political narratives that emphasize the need for continuity in both legal and institutional, the need for stability, multipartisan agreements, and so on. So in its radical version, the evolutive narrative is going to reject constitutional replacement in favor of constitutional amendment. And we see this in several instantiations, which we analyze in the article, right? In the campaign um, for the entry plebiscite in some interventions, that the radical version of the um, evolutive narrative is incompatible with uh, two of, with the two core interests of the left, which are right the establishment of an elected body to draft a new constitution. The radical version would have Congress amending the constitution, and the blank slate is also incompatible with this radical version of the evolutive narrative. Then, if we look at the other kinds of political narratives which we identify as revolutionary. We can see here general emphasis on social transformation, social rights, a constitution written by the people, and also some um, references to the constituent power idea, which is a very important idea, as we know, in um, Latin America. And in its radical version, the revolutionary narrative embraces fully the Schmittian constituent power theory, that is a constituent power with almost no limits. This obviously involves a rejection of the core interests of the um, right-wing parties because it rejects the idea of the super majoritarian rule of two thirds for the approval of constitutional norms as, is cons as inconsistent with um, the will of the people. And also sometimes as we see as a legacy of the Pinochet dictatorship that had included in its constitution um, several super majoritarian norms. And it also involves, right, um, in its radical version, it also involves a rejection on the establishment of limits on the constitution making body. In its more radical versions, this Schmidtian idea of um, an unbounded constituent power is going to be incompatible with the idea as established in the agreement and as a core interest of the evolutive theories to put some limits on what the constitution making body can do both substantively and in terms of procedure. So in the article, right, we <clears throat> go into more detail as to these categories and what exactly they incorporate. And no, we go over the, the day that has taken place in Chile and connected to the different political narratives we identify and how these narratives interact and how they can sometimes become incompatible with a core interest. So we go over the debates of the committee that drafted the rules of the constitution making procedure. We go over the discussion in Congress uh, when the constitutional amendment was to be approved as well as the electoral campaigns and recent interventions in the public sphere by politicians. And we can see there how the radical version of the revolutionary narrative that so far has been, I would say, the most politically salient is incompatible with the um, supermajority rule and has actually argued for rejecting that rule in terms of the constitution making body. But we can see as well how moderate versions of that same political narrative of the um, revolutionary narrative can actually accommodate the idea of a super majoritarian rule by making reference right to a consensus based process or a constitution to put it in terms more consistent with this kind of narrative that is made for the entire Chilean people and has sufficient democratic legitimacy. So then the conclusion then obviously is um, in this article. Well, first of all, uh, we only claim right that the political narratives are just one element in the 
uh, likelihood of an interim constitution to remain self self enforcing doesn't have to be the more important one or even the unique one. There are many ways, right? And there are many other factors that are going to be important in whether or not um, an interim constitution remains self enforcing. And but we do then conclude that if, at least in the case of the Chilean constitution making process, the moderate narratives should prevail. If the moderate narratives prevail, the likelihood of the interim constitution to remain self enforcing is more than if the radical versions prevail, in which case it's more likely that the self enforcing capacity of the interim constitution um, is threatened. So, normatively, we would say there's an argument for preferring no. Um, moderate versions of the political narratives, right? If we have if we want for the um, interim constitution to remain respected and self-enforcing. Thank you, Marcella. Well let me open the floor to questions. I'm gonna switch my view so that I can see everyone. Uh, if you'd like to either pose a question or simply make a comment, you can use the raise hand feature, or if uh, it's easier for you to do so, make yourself visible and you can raise your physical hand. We have a small enough group that I should be able to see everyone. And I see Sergio's hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure also to, to, to be here. Uh, I have a um, comment slash questions for, for Josh's presentation. Um, so my first question is, is whether the prescription offered in his uh, in his future paper will be addressed only for the U.S. or also for all uh, countries that have a presidential regime. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the if the answer is the former, then I wonder how this will impact in the nature of the presidential regime. Maybe he is arguing also for the establishment of a parliamentary regime or a hybrid regime. Uh, I can see that um, in some cases, this type of average regimes produce a lot of problems regarding impeachment. I think a complicated case, but a very useful one for him to maybe to explore if he hasn't done so already is the Peruvian case um, that, that I think could be very, very useful. Um, because uh, when one changes the impeachment procedure and opens the cause um, um, and doesn't really um, balance that with the powers of the president, uh, then uh, different different um, consequences can be triggered. And so it's important to take a look at that. The second question that I have for him is, um, it has to do with the role of the law, right? Uh, so what is the role of the law in, 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 in this in, in general? And I can see very, a lot of possibilities. Uh, and I think for mapping all the different possibilities, uh, perhaps uh, Josh, um, you, you, you will, it will be useful for you to consider other cases as well. Uh, so one possibility is that you know, the, the law, the legal cost may reduce the accountability and they will produce uh, a fertile ground for cynical arguments. So in the end, everything will be about politics and, and so on. But another possibility is that it will force politicians to make uh, principled arguments uh, voters care about, right? Um, and these two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive, I think. Maybe they are, but, uh, but I'm not convinced that they necessarily are. I think that that will need more justification. Uh, and I can see other possible advantages. I'm not necessarily convinced. I'm just playing the, the devil's advocate here. Other possible advantages of, um, of having a narrower legal uh, causes. Um, I think that uh, it can force politicians to make serious arguments. It can increase due process um, if there's such a thing in, in congressional uh, procedures. Along with a free press and transparency, this can also increase the level of the public debate and the deliberations. So it can also increase the level of accountability um, in front of a, of a, of a president. Uh, and it can also increase the transaction costs for doing it. And increasing the transaction cost could be useful if you want to separate this from, um, from judicial uh, procedures as well. Um, and also it can deter politicians from presenting too many impeachments, uh, but perhaps that is uh, not necessarily a problem. Um, uh, but if it is, then the question is how to assess uh, whether uh, this uh, empirically, because uh, one of the main challenges of this kind of research is that it is very hard to assess when politicians decide not to present an impeachment, right? And for making an empirical claim, I think that possibility needs to be assessed, perhaps with interviews, I, I don't know. Thank you. Josh, go ahead. Sure, those are, those are great. Questions. Thank you for the the questions. Um, 
uh, all countries, not just the US, very ambitious. Um, but um, I do take seriously the concern of the parliamentarization of presidential systems. And I think there are some reasons for concern about mapping that on. I mean, some of them just have to do with democratic legitimacy. A president is democratically elected in the way that a prime minister isn't. Um, that said, I mean, one big difference between us and a parliamentary system or Latin American presidential systems is the supermajority rules. Um, and so I do think if you have a supermajority threshold, I mean, we could talk about what the exact um, threshold should be, but that it does stop it from becoming um, just parliamentarism um, in um, the United States or, or in Latin America. Um, I mean, another really important factor, as I'm sure you know, which would be a longer discussion and it plays into Brazil is the electoral rules and how it structures the parties, right? If you have an extremely fractured system, I think this can also lead to um, excessive use of impeachment. Um, uh, uh, but the second point I think um, about law, I, I appreciate you bring the point and I, I know you're, you're uh, being devil's advocate to some extent, um, but I don't, I'm skeptical and uh, that law is making people make more principled arguments uh, in these cases. Um, uh, you know, the two cases I know best, the United States and Brazil and other cases in the United States, I just don't think that's what's happening. Um, and I think, you know, I, I was, a, as a young law student and scholar, was really fascinated with this idea that if we constitutionalize politics to some extent, we can come up with a common language so we wouldn't have to resort to violence. You know, if we are using the same terms, maybe we could have a great dialogue or something like that. You know, if we, we, could, only, we could only talk if we speak the same language. I just don't think that's really, I don't know, maybe it helps a little bit um, and maybe we're just seeing an extreme moment, but of course the civil war in the United States was basically a constitutional debate over um, secession. And it happened in completely unconstitutional terms and I don't think there's any evidence that it helped at all. Um, and, I, and I think similarly, um, in all, I mean, there's great books on Latin American impeachment, a great book in particular, and they all seem to be like inherently political. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, these impeachment clauses or other clauses about, as you know, in Ecuador, uh, clauses that it could only be for insanity, those get stretched out in kind of weird ways that don't seem particularly principled. Anyway, um, so yeah, um, I'll, I'm just gonna say ahead of time, uh, you know, I, I hope to hear David, maybe David's question isn't for me, but insofar as it is, um, David has been so generous in the paper after papers in which I come after him and disagree with him. Um, and, you know, I was a junior scholar and he was very kind um, without being condescending to me. Um, and so when a junior scholar did something similar to me, I tried to channel David's um, very encouraging and, and helpful energy. So thank, thank you, David, for your inspiration on, on this paper. I don't stand on your shoulders, but I, uh, you know, benefit from your work. <laughs> Thanks so much, Josh. David. Yeah, well, these are, um, I just want to thank my two uh, co-panelists and thanks, Josh, for your, for your remarks just now. I appreciate that very much. Um, I, uh, it's been a pleasure engaging with your work now over a pretty long period of time. Uh, it's been cool. Um, so um, I have questions really for, for both of you, I guess, uh, Josh and Marcella. Um, I, um, I'm Josh, you know, so I wonder, I mean, I think, I think many of the points you're making are correct, I think, and important. Um, but I wonder if the conclusion you're drawing is correct, right? Uh, so I think like the, sorry, <laughs> the, um, the uh, where I think you're, you know, where I think you're clearly right, right, is insane. It, it, at the end of the day, like politics is the constraint, right? And I do think like, it goes back to, I think the book you just mentioned, the Annabelle Presley non book on impeachment in Latin America, where it kind of, it, it, I think it shows really well how like just in it's only certain political contexts, right, where impeachment's going to emerge. Politics, I think he refers to it as a shield, essentially, right? And I think in a lot of ways that's right. I think though, with respect to the like with respect to the with respect to the the standard and the relationship between the standard and outcomes, um, I think I could, without a huge amount of difficulty. I could certainly be convinced that the standard is not the most important factor, right? That there's other stuff that that goes on that, that supersedes it, um, and that the and the politics is more important. And if political actors want somebody out, they're going to find a way. And if they don't, they're 
it's not going to happen, right? Um, I wonder about this idea, though, which is embedded, that it's counterproductive, actually, to have a broader impeachment standard. I think that's less likely, right? I think, and I think, I mean, I'm thinking about the Brazilian case. I'm also thinking about the Paraguayan case with Lugo, right, where I think, you know, the broader standard, so it's true, as you say, and I think it's an interesting fact that there's a push towards legalism often in impeachment. And I think it's kind of fascinating because like you don't see that at all, of course, with a no confidence vote where it's just seen as politics, you know, going back to this point of, of parliamentarization. Uh, and it's interesting that impeachment, even where the grounds are broad, actors tend to pull towards the legal. Um, I think that, that that tendency itself is very interesting, I think, and worth exploring. But it seems to me that the breadth the broader standard, even though it was not triggered, it's correct, in the uh, Rousseff impeachment or in the or in the earlier, you know, in the earlier impeachment, both focus more on law. Uh, even Lugo in Paraguay focused to some degree on law, but I, I still think, you know, after looking, after kind of looking and thinking about those cases, it still seems to me that the broader standard did work, right? Uh, and so that could be wrong, I think, right? But I think the I think the possibility would be that implicitly that broader standard is still doing some work and still in some ways easing the pathway in situations where, as you say, like the Rousseff impeachment, the legal claims were terrible. I mean, they were flimsy. Um, a related point to that, and this goes to Sergio's question, is like risk of overuse, you know, that there's risk of overuse of impeachment. And this is where, I, where, we, where uh, Tom Aziz and I came down in the paper was really to say like that risk that we think is actually overstated, right? That, uh, that outcomes post impeachment are pretty good democratically usually. Uh, and that if anything, it's, it's too rare, you know? And Brazil would be a great test case because it's getting to be awfully frequent, um, it seems. Like is the, is the Brazilian case overuse? And I, we, we can point to some uh, structural um, structural problems in the in the in the uh, Brazilian case. The main one of which we I think we identify in the paper is kind of um, the reset mechanism, right? If you want impeachment to act as a reset, uh, the way both the U.S. and Brazil do it isn't great because it just kind of throws the VP into power rather than triggering a new election, right? And so that in Brazil, the aftermath of the Rousseff impeachment was disastrous because you have Tamar in there who's a weak figure uh, and just kind of a creature of the various coalition actors. It's interesting, I think, to think about whether it would have been different if you had had a reset mechanism where you would have had a new election called right after the impeachment. Now, maybe you would have gotten Bolsonaro earlier. I don't know, right? But I think it's an interesting, in other words, there's, there's ways you could have re-envisioned the design in Brazil that may have made a difference. Um, the, um, uh, some, sorry, that was a long, I'm not sure that was a question or what, but that's a bunch of, a bunch of thoughts. Um, Marcela, I think on, on, on your and Sergio's uh, paper, it's, it, it's really interesting. I think it's fascinating. I think it does a, a really neat job of, um, of trying to bring together the politics and the kind of theory of constitution making in ways that, well, I guess, I guess both Josh and I thought a lot about, right? Um, and, um, I think the, the the comment I think I would make is, so I think one one way to think about the, the line of thought you're pursuing, um, consistency between pol politics and discourse, right? But also uh, politics is kind of constraint on discourse in a, in a sense. And so like, you know, there's a radical, sort of Bolivarian discourse that shows up in Chile but I'm curious as to what you think the risks are of uh, kind of overspilling of that discourse such that it, you know, the process gets run kind of off the rails, right? Because um, it's always seemed to me that like, there's a check against that in Chile, which is precisely the political context, right? Um, maybe also aspects of legal culture, to use a term that makes me not very comfortable, right? But I think, you know, I, in other words, I wonder whether like we we are obsessed with these contexts where constituent power runs off the rails, me included, for, uh, probably maybe more than anybody. But 
it seems like in the Chilean case, like in a paradoxical way, because of the politics, there's a different risk. And the risk is kind of like actually excessive veto points in a way. And I just wonder then how you think about like the extreme way to take this would be that like the politics is the constraint. And usually the politics is actually a constraint in a kind of dishearteningly uh, unproductive way, right? Marcelo, why don't you take the question that he just asked, uh, that David just asked first, and then maybe we'll circle back to Josh. Um, so thank you, by the way, for the question and comment. So I think a couple of months ago, I would have said, yeah, you're probably right. Now, I think there is the, I think the radicalization of political narratives in Tibet, it's really a thing. And um, more and more so. And it seems to me that it's really difficult to say, but there have been moments where um, the capacity, so where the limits imposed by the agreement and the constitutional amendment had been threatened to some extent. Um, we're not there yet, but I, I used to see it as less of a possibility um, with how Chilean politics right now, I'm less sure. I think there's a tendency um, for polarization both ways. I mean, if you just look at the presidential elections, I think that's one indication when you have the far right candidate, right, gaining and gaining support as well as the far left candidate, which is really unusual in Chile in the past years. So <clears throat> I think I'm not sure, I think you're right, right? That up until this point, you, I would have agreed with you, like we would see that like politics itself and the discourse sort of containing itself, being a constraint and so on. I'm less sure at this time how things are gonna look. I think there's the possibility that they don't anymore, but I don't really, right? We see the radicalization, but I'm not sure what the explanation is. It's, it's really too soon to say. So I think I'm, I'm a little bit less optimistic and a lot will turn on what happens in the coming weeks. Yeah. Josh, did you want to respond to David's comment to you? Yeah, and, and maybe I can ask a question too, uh, if no one else is on the queue. Um, uh, David, um, again, thank you for your, your, your paper and, and your, your generosity um, in engaging about it. Um, I think you're, I mean, I think the central insight that I'd like to develop more um, is why is there legalism in the cases where it's the least needed by the constitution? Like what, what is happening there? Um, and so I don't mean to say um, in response to Sergio that like law isn't important. It's just, it's not always law driving politics, it's politics sometimes driving law, right? Um, and, and understanding that um, can help us think through how to, how to draft the law itself, um, right? Um, so, um, I, it, is it the case though that um, even if they choose the more narrow legal option that the broader one is doing important work, um, maybe in Paraguay, um, I, don't, I don't know, I'd have to think about it more. I mean, is the idea that people are less upset about um, if you, I mean, yeah, I just, I don't, I mean, it's, so the idea is that the, so one of the reform ideas I had was, well, just like, I mean, I think on any of the reform ideas I have, I think it's fine to have a broad one, right? The issue is whether you're gonna only have a broad one. So I think I'm on the same page with you, you know, keep the broad one in, right? But also have these narrow ones so that you can have the civilizing force of hypocrisy. Um, so I think that works well with my thesis for, what it's worth. Um, my question uh, for Marcella and by extension for Sergio and then one for, for David. Um, I know Marcella and, and Sergio, you've been following Chile more closely than I have, but I have been trying to keep up. Um, and to me, it's, I mean, I, it's very good support for your paper, what's happening right now. Um, and um, and I, I wonder if we are hitting the point of no return, um, because as I understand it, we don't have a kind of dramatic moment like in, I don't know, Venezuela or Ecuador or Bolivia yet. 
but we're laying the groundwork for it. And we're not only laying the groundwork for it by like a bunch of talk or radicalization, they are violating the rules set out by the constitution about how this is supposed to be done, right? The voting rule says one thing and they have said another thing, right? And that other thing isn't like a huge change. It may not matter very much, it may never be used, but it's a violation of the rules. Um, and um, they've said, you know, why do we have the right to do these rules? Put our constituent scenario, right? We have the original constituent power. Tell me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of what I've been getting from kind of trying to read uh, every now and then the Chilean papers. Um, so that means that the framework and, and why it's such strong support for your case, I think, is that it's completely unnecessary for the core interests of the party because if it's a two thirds rule, they have the center left and the left have two thirds, right? The two thirds rule doesn't make any difference anymore because unexpectedly the right wing party, Chile Vamos got such a low number that they don't have a veto power. And that's what makes it, this is something I'm writing, so much different than in the American case where by virtue of a consensus rule, right? Rhode Island keeps on blocking things. This makes it different than in the French revolution, right? These are kind of the classic cases of constitutional violations where any, where these two estates the clergy and the nobles could block the third estate of commoners, right? And it makes it different than in Bolivia too, right? Which is the main real comparison for, for us in dealing with Latin America. So in a case in which it's completely unnecessary to try and break the government set rules and the supermajority rules by virtue of getting caught up in your own revolutionary narratives, they're starting to break them. Um, so um, yeah, I, 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 I'm curious if I'm misunderstanding events and to hear more about them. For David, just uh, briefly, um, I like the paper a lot. Um, two questions. Um, one, I, I think it's probably consistent with your previous work, but in a lot of your work, you've um, evinced, I think, a very justified skepticism of courts or other non-political bodies being able to stop, um, stop politics, um, right? Especially, I mean, it's been in the constitution making context. Um, and in this, context, it seems like you think port courts and administrative bodies can play an important role. And I can imagine a lot of different reasons why in this context that's the case, but I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are. So so for Masal and Sergio, do, do I understand the events correctly? Does it support your narrative more than, more than we even realize? Marcelo, why don't you respond and then back to David. Sure. So yeah, so I think, so there are some indications that some of the rules, so I think the two third rule has been spared and it might be partly because of what you just said, right? That perhaps surprisingly, the veto power isn't, isn't held by the people who planned for the rule to operate in a certain way, right? The right wing was supposed to get one third of the seats, didn't. And so the debate has um, moved a little bit, but not entirely away from that. I think um, if you take a look, so recently the convention approved the sort of rules of procedure for its functioning and it preserved the two thirds rule, though it didn't expand its reach, right? So it, it preserved, but it didn't, I wouldn't say it's a violation of the agreement, but there is a rule for which they have been fairly criticized, which is the idea that when a rule doesn't get the two thirds in the convention, there's been a proposal to take them to plebiscite. If the, if the norm achieves, I think, three fifths of the constitution makers, but not the two thirds, right? Um, they are trying to establish the plebiscite to overrule, right, the convention that will require possibly a constitutional amendment. So um, it's too soon to say, you could say, well, there's a breach. That's a breach, definitely. And it has relation to radical versions of the narratives, I would say, yes. Um, but it's too soon to know what will happen. It will maybe just be dead because if there's no constitutional amendment to approve the plebiscites, it won't um, go on. And um, there are other things as well that you would say, mm, this looks like a little bit of a breach of the, of the initial norms. And I don't know if, I was wondering whether Sergio would want to add up since we have him here. Uh, if you wanna add anything to, to these, uh, what do you think these things are, are looking like? 
Thanks, Marcela. Um, yeah, if I may just very, very, very briefly um, to, to react to some of the things that David and, and, and just said. So first of all, the, the center left and the left are not disciplined. Uh, there are many factions within them, and it is very unclear whether they will operate as a block. Currently, I think the median uh, voter within the convention uh, is the Frente Amplio and the socialists, but the center left is not part of that group. The indigenous peoples and the Pueblo Constituyente are also not part of that group. I think these are the ones that are having the um, are, are being able to manage the cleavage uh, right right now, and they have different agendas. So, for example, the Communist Party wants a presidential regime, right? Because for them, the presidential regime is more closely to the to the neo Bolivarian model, right? But the Frente Amplio wants a parliamentary regime. Uh, so there are differences. Uh, those differences has, haven't been that important until now uh, because the convention has been focused more on the procedure than on the content of the new constitution. But when the debate about the content of the new constitution starts, uh, these differences will show up more often. Um, what I find striking is that the, um, we have an interim constitution. It's not formally an interim constitution, but it's like a set of rules that are managing the process. Um, and most of the uh, constituyentes um, navigate within the language of the interim constitution, even if they are infringing parts of them. And, and some parts of them have been violated, like clearly. And here scholars have some sort of disagreements uh, about it, but there's always an interpretation to keep uh, those infringements within the uh, some sort of vague principle language that is part also of the interim constitution. So actually here the law has mattered uh, in a way that is relevant to uh, at least produce the um, uh, a common language that can uh, everyone can uh, can access. And, and I think that that's an important part of the interim constitution. But there's a tension. There are always tensions because different parties have different interpretations uh, and. Um, and tensions will, will exist, and I think they will be uh, broadened uh, also because of the participatory mechanisms that uh, were approved um, and the way they opened the way for opportunistic behavior uh, for some groups. Um, it is unclear what will happen in the future um, because, because maybe this also will be tied to the fact that we're having elections in November. Some people think that after the elections, things will uh, be better. But now the constituyentes are also focusing on the presidential and the congressional campaigns, and they are part of their campaigns. They're supporting candidates. Uh, so, they, so you know, there's this thing that I think this is an idea for another paper that Marcel and I will probably write. But this thing about uh, asambleas constituyentes being superior to congresses because they lack uh, the self-interest uh, that uh, legislators have is actually not really true, right? It's just that they have another type of uh, interest. Uh, and I think the Chilean case will be a very good case study for that. But of course, we're, we're writing papers on a moving target. So, so this is also one of the problems that our research has uh, now. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, David, do you want to go back to the second part of uh, Josh's uh, question to you? To, to the extent we remember, I recognize it's getting to be pretty late in the afternoon. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll just, I'll be brief. I mean, thanks, by the way, Marcelo and Sergio, for laying that out. It's, it's so useful and kind of fascinating to get this perspective on events that are going on right now and are so important. Um, uh, to, to Josh's question, um, so I don't think that there is a general answer to judicial effectiveness or administrative effectiveness in kind of constraining corralling politics. Corralling is too strong, right? But in kind of dealing with political problems, I think it's a contextual one. And I mean, I think where we draw this idea from that this pathway can be useful is kind of two points. One is legislative pathways disqualification don't appear to be very robust kind of anywhere, right, that we can see. Um, and then, the, and that's related, I think, to the rarity of impeachment. Um, although it is kind of striking that disqualification seems even more difficult, right, to carry through. And then the other is that there are systems where administrative slash judicial actors are quite active. And I think that that's related to an attitude or ideology that I think shows up in a lot of systems that is worth attention, which is the kind of like, um, the, I'm not sure exactly how to refer to it, like the uh, 
the tainted political sphere ideology, I guess I would call it, right? That the political sphere itself is the problem and that these actors are outside of it and can help to cleanse it. And that's a very powerful ideology in certain countries, I think. Um, it shows up as a, it's a comparative matter in both institutional design and practice. And I think, you know, so Israel, where you see this, so you have Doden calls kind of like bizarre substitute for impeachment, which is just the court saying people, because of crimes, but also because of non-criminal conduct that is bad conduct, that they can't sit, right? And you have the court making these decisions. Places like Pakistan, which have very vague standards along the same lines in the constitution. Uh, Colombia, where like, for example, the elected mayor of Bogota was removed from office and disqualified for botching the, gar the reverse garbage privatization for like, re you know, restatifying garbage collection very poorly. And the, um, the general procurator of Colombia removed, removed Petro from office, ended up in front of the Inter-American Court, actually, and he was reinstated. Um, but those are, those, so those contexts suggest to me that there's at least not a general problem of judicial and administrative passivity, right, uh, in these contexts. And obviously, there's a, there's a choice of institutional design, court or agency. I think the illustration example shows that those can operate quite differently. Actually, in illustration regimes, the administrative route tends to be the most active, and the judicial route tends to be more concerned about trial-like procedures that tend to slow down illustrations and, and stop them in a number of cases. There is a separate normative question as to whether having an active route is, is good and whether you can ameliorate the abuses of such a route, which exists in all three of the countries I, I mentioned by things like drawing, drawing a good substance standard, right? Um, and I think it's a difficult question, but what I do think is true in the US is like the prospects for uh, any other route bearing significant fruit are nil, right? I think, and I think the aftermath of January 6th showed that, um, that the legislative route was not gonna function. Um, like a reinvigoration of, of section three of the, of the 14th amendment, um, Maybe, right? I think if it was drawn right, and that would be there. The, it's 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 there's a lot of legislative power there, but ultimately you could uh, delegate that authority potentially. I think certainly to judiciary and maybe to an administrative actor. Well, thanks, David. Um, I I um, am not seeing any other hands up. Um, Maybe, uh, oh, Marcella, go ahead. Yeah, I would love the opportunity to ask questions too if, yeah, if no one else wants to. So, um, Josh, I was wondering um, about the, so you say, you know, if impeachment became more normalized on the basis of discontent, would you then perhaps think about David's paper um, untangle the, you know, removing someone from office from the future or disqualification to hold office again in your proposal, right? Because otherwise it would be uh, kind of much, I think it would probably lead you in that um, direction, right? And then for David, um, I know you said, you know, that the categorization is always difficult and if you push on it, it's going to, but I was wondering um, why you think illustration is group-based? Because I would have thought, so obviously political party, obviously group-based, right? But illustration, it, it seems that it really depends on how it operates in practice, right? Because sometimes it is individual based, it, of, of course, in relation to a certain class of people, right? But it, it's, it's effectively done at the level of the individual. And then you have sometimes when it's, uh, in, when it's done in such like a collective application of, of, of manner. Josh, why don't you go? Um, so, <laughs> Well, the question is, what would I do about disqualification in my imaginary regime? Um, yeah, I've given zero thought to it in the past. Um, you know, uh, I think it's a fair question. It's just I haven't really thought about it until I read David's paper, you know, yesterday. Um, so, you know, the question really should be for 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 David in some sense. Um, and I do think, but I do think it brings up an interesting point. And I, I guess all I can comment and is just to say that it's interesting is to think about 
whether the question, I mean, David has written now two papers, um, one is about impeachment and one is about disqualification. And so there is an interest, I think you're right that there's an interesting question about to what extent is your regime for disqualification based upon your, your um, regime for impeachment. Um, uh, so, I mean, it partly depends on whether, and I think David has done a good job teasing this apart, like, can you have disqualification without impeachment? And if you can, then like, I don't, uh, and David, I think has shown you can. Um, and so maybe this, I guess, is my answer. Insofar as disqualification and impeachment are separate, I don't think the impeachment regime needs to change that much. I mean, I suppose you can impeach people all the time. I mean, the last thing I'll say is, you know, uh, and David's other paper has done a good job showing this. And if you look in the Nixon impeachment and, and what's happened, people are trying to impeach people all the time, right? Like it's just the day someone becomes a president, there are going to be some bills to impeach them or, you know, within the year. Um, so I, I think that at least is some evidence that the fear that like this is going to unleash impeachment in a way that we currently don't have it might be a little overwrought. I mean, I, I can imagine some responses, which is like, well, it's just one one crazy you know, person. But um, so that's something to think about. I, I'm also going to take the liberty to just ask a question, if that's OK, moderator, um, which is just to push back against Sergio a little bit, because um, so, or ask more questions, which is, you know, Sergio is saying, look, these aren't real violations of what's happening in Chile. But to me, I, and I'd be curious to hear what the legal explanations are going on. And, and I'm writing something about this right now, but to me, there are three violations. And, and I'd be curious how all three of these can be explained away. Violation number one, right? The constitution, the interim constitution, the amendment says, you're gonna approve these rules by two thirds. And um, they approved the general rules by a majority vote, even if they approved saying, we're gonna hold on to a two thirds rule. Violation two, some of these things, we have this three fifths option, right? And I understand maybe it requires a constitutional amendment. Violation three, we're doing this by virtue of the original constituent power, right? We're sovereign, that's what that means. And the old constitution said, you cannot declare yourself to be sovereign. So especially that third one, which is mostly symbolic, and the first one, when they're vote by a majority. I'd be curious how that can be explained away legally. Um, I'm all for these kinds of important explanations that um, hold us together to a legalistic framework. Um, but I think just as a matter of straightforward legal analysis, those seem like violations of the interim constitution. Let me uh, ask David to respond first to Marcella's earlier question and then turn it over to Sergio and Marcella if she likes to respond to Josh. David. Well, um, thanks so much. Yeah, I would, I would say also with, with, with Josh, just very briefly on the, on the separating the two, like I do think one thing that's fascinating is how often systems, when decision makers are asked to make a choice themselves decouple the two routes, like I, saw, I think that aspect of like the Rousseff impeachment is fascinating, right? That there was not the, there was not the will there to disqualify, although there was to remove. Um, and that suggests differences. And, and the tendency of that throughout US history, right? I mean, I'll see Hastings got impeached and removed as a judge and then elected to Congress, right? Uh, thereafter. Um, and so it's fascinating how these, how these, and they are, I guess, analytically distinct, you know, uh, in both directions. Like, I think it's kind of reasonable to remove a judge from a judgeship, but say, but you can run politically, you know, cause there's not, it's like, it's kind of bizarre that someone could win right at that point, but it's like, they're, they're different, analytically different questions. Um, and it may go the other way, you know, as well, where obviously there are cases where somebody has never held office you would want to have disqualified, right? I think for other acts that they that they carried out. But the, I think your point on the typology, you know, I think you're right. Like I think um, in, in the sense that illustration can have a more individual and more group valence, I think is right. Um, I think where it is always kind of group-like, and you mentioned this, I think in the question, is that it's disqualification based on membership or affiliation, right, with a, with a regime. And I think to that extent, it's kind of it's kind of group like like it it doesn't in and of itself make a lot of judgments about the individual's conduct. It's more about the individual's membership in a certain set of ranks with respect to the old regime. Even that is not quite right, right? I mean, I think like if you look 
uh, the German example is a good one where there was like, there would be like a trial sort of process where then people would, there would be a discussion of what the responsibility actually was, right? Like, so it would become kind of individualized. And I think our proposal for what you might do to reinvigorate section three of the 14th amendment is also kind of um, along those lines, right? Because it's sort of like to, it, it we're very wary, I think rightly of group-based disqualifications in non-transitional contexts, but which means I think whatever you would do with the 14th amendment, like we should be queasy about it. It looks bizarre, right, in modern terms, but it could be used and turned into something that, that, that is productive and more narrowly or individually focused, I think. Sergio. Yes, uh, thanks to Josh for the, for the question. So I think Josh's question uh, also helped us to um, uh, to strengthen the, the argument of our paper, right? Uh, because of the three violations uh, that um, that Josh uh, identifies, the third one is about a political narrative, right? It's about uh, using the narrative of the constituent power. And the first two ones are actually specific behaviors targeting uh, the core interests. Uh, so using a narrative is, is not necessarily uh, a violation of the core interest because you can respect a core interest while having a discourse about the constituent power. Uh, but you can have uh, two different, and as we can see, we have seen in the uh, in Chile in the political discourse at least two versions of the constituent power. And I'm not speaking about academic theories, uh, you know, trying to sophisticate the idea of the constituent power or correcting it. I'm speaking basically about a moderate version and a radical version. The moderate version will say we have constituent power because we have sovereignty to decide the content of the new constitution, but the sovereign power uh, um, in this moderate version uh, lacks uh, the, the power to alter the procedures. Uh, whereas the radical version will say, no, uh, the constituent power will empower us uh, not only to decide on the content of the new constitution, but also to decide on the procedures, right? And these two narratives are present in Chile and, they, and both of them are in tension. Um, and, uh, and most of the politicians that endorse these narratives, they need to compromise. You see people in the left uh, using both of them. You see people in the right saying, you know, there's no uh, constituent power here. We only see the relative power here uh, and so on. These, of course, are not sophisticated academic debates. These are just decisions that politicians make, but that are very important for the way in, the, in which they phrase these things. So, for example, the Pueblo Constituyente and the, and the Communist Party are typically using the radical version of the constituent power theory. They were never part of the interim constitution. They didn't agree to it, actually. They didn't endorse it. So for them, this is of, this is something they can you know, throw away, even if it, that's illegal. But it creates a problem for the sectors of the left that endorse the agreement, right? So the moderate version of the constituent power is uh, better for them so they can justify uh, sticking with the procedures. But then they need to compromise with the other part of the left, uh, even though they have a different discourse. Uh, but they are voting together in these procedural issues. Uh, so what they will say to justify the infractions that they have committed, uh, for example, in the first one, will be, you know, we voted by majority rule to respect the agreement. We voted by majority rule to respect the two thirds. Uh, so we're respecting the two thirds. And they will say that, and that's very cynical, you know, and it's, but it's part of the political discourse. And on the, on the second point uh, regarding the, the plebiscites that they can call, uh, the standard answer that they will tell you is that they put, they included a clause saying that this re requires a constitutional amendment. Therefore, the Congress needs to do something. Therefore, they are not violating the agreement because they are uh, amending the constitution according to the rules of, of the of the interim constitution, if you if if you want to, um, so so in that and the Congress, uh, the right wing has more than a than a third, and is likely to remain more than a third after the November elections. I may be wrong about this, but they are likely to remain that. So so um, so this second part, even though it goes against the the original agreement, it uses procedures that are endorsed by the by the original agreement. There are other violations that are more straightforward for me, even though they are very small, so maybe they don't catch the attention of the, of the international media. Uh, one of them is the way um, constitution makers uh, can resign and the way constitution makers can be uh, replaced. They basically changed that. Uh, there were rules about that and they just changed it. Uh, 
And they changed it because of a very specific case of a person that wants to resign. Uh, and just they created a new rule uh, for that person and because they don't want to lose that, uh, that, that slot. And they approved that by simple majority. Um, so they, they didn't amend the constitution or anything for that. So for me, that's a clear, very straightforward violation. But because it's not um, related to the to the to the two thirds rule, you know, or the, or the or the core interest that the parties really really care about, uh, this perhaps has been, uh, even though it's a violation, it has uh, it, it didn't it hasn't received enough attention. Marcella, did you want to add anything? I know. I think. Maybe I would say that, so I was thinking, maybe Josh, you were thinking about the first article of the rules of procedure that the convention approved when they talk about the constituent power. And I, I actually think that's, um, it's a very strange article, but I actually think that they managed to somehow not violate the, you know, what you we were saying, this idea that the the power resides still in the nation. They say that sovereignty resides in the peoples, which is a kind of slight modification. But it then say, you know, after saying that the convention has original um, constituent power, they then say that it's only mandated to draft a proposed constitution that will be, you know, voted in an exit plebiscite. So it's a really, you can see how the compromises sort of play out. And then I agree with what Sergio, I think, has covered all of the, the rest of it. Um, well, seeing no hands, let me just give any of the panelists a, a last opportunity to make any final comments. We've got about seven minutes left. But I won't keep us if there aren't any. Okay, well, let me then just thank you all for a really wonderful and stimulating conversation. I, I especially appreciate the way each of you engaged with one another's papers. And, and that goes for you too, Sergio, as well as the three named panelists here. It was wonderful to have you. And thanks to those of you who stuck around for the full discussion. We really appreciate it. Hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. If, this, if we were all together here in person in Madison, I'd invite you all to go across the street to the Memorial Union for a drink. Uh, but uh, since we can't do that, I'll just have to raise a pretend glass to you all. And I see a, a hand up there from Ji Chen. Go ahead. Oh, no, that was just a fake hand, I guess. All right. Thanks to you all. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some of you at least tomorrow. Take care. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.